Um, last year, I, met, I had the pleasure of meeting David at NodeConf EU, and um, we spent some real quality time together as we both missed the bus to get back to the airport um, at <clears throat> too early in the morning to actually get any, anywhere. And um, we, we had a very long bus ride, a city bus ride, through Ireland to get to the airport, and then a lot of running through the airport. And I didn't even get to say goodbye to him in the airport because we both just had to go immediately in opposite directions. But meeting David there got me the opportunity to speak here and have a lot of fun conversations with David while he's been working with the core team on, on some issue triaging issues. So it's fantastic to have David, and I'm excited to be able to speak here to uh, LXJS and talk to you guys about, about some Node. So my talk here is about foundations of Node.js. It's easy sometimes while you're working through a piece of software to forget how you've gotten to where you are. Maybe you're working on a particular bug, you're focused on how to solve a symptom, but missing the bigger picture and therefore the right solution to your problem. For instance, the asynchronous nature of Node can sometimes make it tempting to add set immediate or next tick to alleviate a problem. But in reality, you're introducing new subtle bugs perhaps not just for you, but for your consumers. By changing the seemingly innocuous line of code, you somehow change the order of events, and anyone relying on the previous implicit order is now broken. We hit these kinds of bugs in Node all of the time. So while you're working on these sorts of problems, it's important to zoom out, get the macro or holistic view to make sure you've not lost the vision and the importance of what problems you're actually trying to solve. My name's TJ Fontaine. I'm an engineer at Joint and the project lead of no for Node.js. For 14 years, I was, pr I was primarily a systems administrator and software developer on contract. I had to support all kinds of applications across a variety of environments, from your standard Windows and Linux installs to more esoteric environments like AIX 5.3 and HPUX 10.2. And I don't know if you've had the pleasure or the pain to actually support an application running on HPUX 10.2, but it came with some really bleeding edge software. This was early 2000s, and I had Perl version 4. And I want you to know that's an important thing, and a PA RISC chip that was blazing fast. You, unbelievable speed. But my passion and my motivation was largely spent in open source projects in my spare time. So when I had the opportunity to work at Joyent, I was incredibly excited by the fact I was going to work full time on open source and not just 20% of my time. It wasn't just any open source project, it was my new crush, Node.js. I could finally leave my Python and twisted chains behind me. Node.js is far from the first framework that hit the back end. Many have come before it, many will follow it. In the infancy of the web, you had people writing C and doing CGI and frameworks around that like Yahoo. There were people who then and still now believe Perl is the right choice for the back end. And of course, there are people who are enslaved, I mean, <clears throat> enjoying their time using Java and .NET. But what we have with Node.js is perhaps the right language and the right framework at the right time for developing in our new Internet of Things world. So for those of you who are playing buzzword, buzzword bingo, I just said Internet of Things. <clears throat> JavaScript is now not only empowering those writing rich front end experiences, it's also powering the back ends. And it's enabling teams to not only share assets between the front and back end, but it's enabling them to share engineering resources as well. First, Node.js is built on JavaScript, a mostly standardized language whose Future is guided by large companies and, motiv and motivated community members who graciously participate in what must be some of the most exciting standards meetings on the planet. Um, and I'm very thankful that it's not me going to those standards meetings. And it's not surprising for me to say this, but here at a JavaScript conference, but JavaScript is what defines Node.js, but it's also what sets us apart from all of the frameworks and other, and other backends. Since we don't have to maintain our language, we don't have to maintain our own virtual machine, and our runtime. Instead, we get to focus precisely on delivering a piece of software that succinctly solves the challenges faced by you, our engineers. Since it's clear, at least in hindsight, that JavaScript was the right language to pick for this framework, the next question is, what should this framework do? 
There are many examples of frameworks that one can look to for guidance, and there are certainly many models that can be picked from, but what makes Node.js attractive to many people is the fact that we have such a small core. While Node.js runs now on Windows, the influence of the POSIX and Unix operating systems on our APIs is clear. Node is really just a thin veneer over top of the common Unix operating system APIs that, were most, that most people were already familiar with. It makes sense, then, that the ethos of Node follows closely to that of what most people consider the Unix model of do one thing, do it well. In fact, most of our module ecosystem has adopted that philosophy as well, especially if your name is Substack. Perhaps what is sometimes glossed over about Node is actually its ability to abstract the operating system away from you. A lot of people look at Node.js as their Java do-over, and perhaps we're about as close as you can get to write once, run everywhere. But it's not actually just about our ability to straddle multiple operating systems that needs to be highlighted. What I think is interesting has to do with the fact that each flavor of operating system recognized and attempted to solve the need for scalable non-blocking I.O. Open source or proprietary, micro or monolithic, Emacs or Vim, tabs or spaces, regardless of the religious nature of these operating systems, they each solve for non-blocking I.O., sometimes in wildly different ways, sometimes in exactly the same way, and sometimes out of sheer competition. Maybe that comes from their open source heritage. Maybe it comes from their capitalist markets. It doesn't matter because the end state was that each involved party understood what model the consumer needed to be successful while using their software. And that's exactly the decision-making process that Node.js tries to take while designing the APIs to make you successful. It's not a, just about what other, what other frameworks do, but about trying to understand the use cases and creating a solution that will work for you. So while trying to maintain an ethos of a small core, how does Node identify what should or shouldn't be included in the core APIs? The first question has to do with Node what Node.js is trying to enable its users to do. It's not enough for us to simply give you JavaScript bindings to libc or the kernel. We have to give you the right amount of bootstrapped environment such that we can get you developing and innovating as quickly as possible. Node's design center is around distributed network solutions. So we wanted to provide APIs that can get you to an environment as quickly as possible. But it would arguably be useless if we adopted the predominant front-end language and then didn't also provide a reasonably sane HTTP interface. So the balance of what gets included in Node has to do with what we consider to be our design goals for the end user, but also to identify what would, might be hard for you to get right and provide an, that, that abstraction as well. So you can use the net module and write an HTTP implementation in pure JavaScript that can be installed from the module ecosystem. And I encourage you to do that. Please do that. Node will still provide one for you, though, because it can be difficult to get the semantics of HTTP right and also provide one that's efficient for your usage. So that's part of it, but Node isn't only creating new APIs on our own. Though we have and will continue to do so, it's also about responding to the needs and patterns that we see happening in the broader ecosystem. It would be easy for those who work full time on Node, such as myself, to only work on the parts that interested us and fix those problems that we feel directly. But focusing on that can lead to us getting out of touch of what you actually need. So occasionally, we'll adopt either a whole module or, the, or an API or influenced by a popular module in the ecosystem and include that in core. And we have some good and bad examples of that for Node, but the principle is sound. If what everyone needs to be successful when executing sandbox JavaScript in, is actually contextify, instead of our built-in VM module, then how do we fix our VM implementation to satisfy the needs of the ecosystem such that they don't need a binary dependency and all the pain that comes along with that for deployment? For 0 0.12, the solution there was to actually re-implement VM in terms of contextify. So if you're using JS DOM, you won't need a binary dependency to be able to satisfy that. So having this vibrant module ecosystem and a widely adopted contribution pattern of forking us on GitHub makes developing for and on Node.js exciting. These aren't new ideas to software or open source, and they're not unique to Node.js, but they're a core piece of what has made Node.js successful to date, and they'll be integral to making Node successful going forward. The pluggable nature of our APIs and the ability for people to play with new features in their own branches and of Node 
make it easy for the project to continue to focus on what the current user's needs are and integrate back the new and interesting changes as they are proved out in the broader ecosystem. That is the foundation of Node.js, a small core designed around the idea of solving the problems people are having while also not getting in your way. That foundation isn't changing. In fact, Node is at a fantastic inflection point. We're seeing a ton of adoption from the enterprise and large corporations. And people are leaving their Java encampments to come iterate quickly and solve problems in fun ways. But with the influx of these new, new users and companies come new challenges. When Node started as a scrappy framework that cut its teeth with early adopters, hobbyists, and many startups, it had different requirements. Node was often iterating nearly as fast as its users were. But as we've been growing up, there are more expectations from what Node can and should deliver as a software product to its consumers. So what does, what does change? Doing the Node.js on the road events, which I will be doing one here in Lisbon on Sunday, if you're, if, you are, if you're around, you guys should definitely come and check it out. One thing has become crystal clear. Even though people always want to know what's coming in the next release of Node.js, they're often reticent to change the version that they're currently deployed against. That aversion to risk is good for their deployment strategies, but complicates the future for Node.js. Historically, we've had rocky upgrades, such as, such, and as such, we haven't had the great, re greatest reputation for convincing users to upgrade to our next miner. So since we have to have compelling reasons for users to upgrade, the Node on the Road events, as well as any way we can receive feedback from our users about what is and is not working, are crucial. That feedback is needed when, we, when the project defines its roadmap. That feedback keeps us from fixing things that aren't broken or adding things that aren't needed. But we must also communicate clearly what changes are planned for releases. That way, we can make plans ar around deploy your deployments on Node's future, which is also shaped by what your future is with Node. But along with communicating that our roadmap going forward, we also need to be clear about what our commitment to stability is. Part of that commitment is, is to backwards compatibility. Our ability to continue to fix bugs without breaking existing people's code is a sign of the maturity of the project. We've been doing that a lot better, but there are still places we can improve. For instance, what I mentioned at the start, sometimes for Node, what's more important is not the external API so much as the behavior of events in the system. As we make changes, it needs to be clear we're making fixes for the, for the real problem and not the symptom. That is not to say once we have an API or a behavior that it's set in stone and, we can never, and that can never be changed, we can still break APIs and change behaviors. We just have to provide clear transition paths and communi communicate directly the timing of these changes and their impacts. For instance, if what we wanted to do was deprecate domains, which is what I want to do, we have to be able to let you know domains are being deprecated. Here's the transitional model that you're going to be able to use moving forward, and here's the version that it's actually going to be removed in. We can do that. We can break those, ch we can break those changes. We just have to make sure that we as a project and as a community are all on the same page as to what that means. We have to understand the impact of our changes, not only within Node itself, but the impact to our consumers as well. While, th while this probably has not been the sexiest of talks you've heard today or will hear tomorrow, I wanted to reiterate just exactly what m has made Node successful and how that success will shape it going forward. Node is an amazing technology that, that's enabling an incredibly passionate community, and I'm excited to be a part of that. But the project isn't going to lose sight of what it needs to do to provide quality software and experiences for its stakeholders. The project won't forget how it got here. Instead, it's going to use its strong foundation to take it further. And that's what, that's what the ethos of Node is, of, is getting out there and providing a useful environment for you and a foundation for you to build your work on top of. And it's going to be, continue to be shaped by your input and your needs, but not moving at a pace that's faster than, what you act, than the changes you can actually sustain. And with that, I'm going to let you guys, I'm sure the MC will come up and tell you, but I'm going to give you a little bit of time for your lunch. Uh, thank you. <laughs>